Anger and tears in many parts of Afghanistan, where men say a decision by the Taliban to bar them from universities is another blow to their rights. The government says it's acting in the national interest. So what does this order mean for those who are affected and their future? And how will it impact the standing of the Taliban government and the world order? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahalbarra. Shock, hopelessness and anger. Afghan women are coming to terms with the latest Taliban decision that crushes their rights. Banning them from universities has provoked condemnation from around the world. It is expected to further push back the Taliban government's attempts to be accepted by world powers. Laura Khan finds out what's behind this action. This defiant group of students is taking a stand against the Taliban withdrawing their education. They say their ambitions and dreams cannot be taken from them. In the 21st century, if there is no education, we will vanish from the face of the earth. No one is going to take us seriously and we won't be able to demand our rights. Only with education can we understand our rights and responsibilities. This was the notification of an indefinite ban on women's university education. A gynaecologist in Kabul says a lack of female doctors could put lives in danger. If there is no schools, no universities and uh, no uh, gynaecologists and female doctors, the number of MMR or maternity mortality rate is increasing day by day. Despite strong condemnation from several countries and activist groups, the Taliban is yet to respond officially. But sources have told Al Jazeera the Taliban is divided between reformists, many of whom engage with the international community during talks in Doha, and a more conservative faction. One analyst says the decisions are made by a small minority. Currently, the division is within the government. Uh, those Taliban leaders who negotiated peace uh, with the U.S. in Doha, uh, in Doha, Qatar, uh, they are not against women education. There's only five people who are managing the whole uh, team. These are the hardliners and they are not living in Kabul. Mostly they are stationed in Kandahar. More than a year before the Taliban took power in Afghanistan, its first deputy leader, Sirajuddin Haqqani, wrote an article published in the New York Times. It said women's rights to education would be protected, a promise that has been rolled back. But the US also failed on its promise to use economic tools as leverage to moderate the Taliban. In 2021, it froze nearly $10 billion in assets belonging to the Afghan Central Bank. Women say they're still suffering. Afghan women are in fact in the worst situation. Everything is very difficult for them. Personally, for me as a girl, I've lived these two or one and a half years as the worst years of my life. They were indeed very difficult for me. We urge the international community to support us and negotiate with the Taliban to allow us to continue our studies. Studying is my only passion and I love to study. Many women say they were shocked by the announcement. I was really shocked. I couldn't have uh, believed that there were some rumors that uh, they are going to ban girls from attending universities, but we didn't know that this will happen in the middle of their finals and they won't let these girls graduate. For the moment, scenes like this, women walking to university, hoping to shape their career paths, will stop for the foreseeable future. Laura Khan, Al Jazeera. Let's bring in our guest. Sahar is a psychosocial counselor at the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee and Obaidullah Bahir, founder of the Let Afghan Girls Learn campaign. Welcome to the program. Sahar, give us a sense of what this means for women and female students in Takhaw, Faryab, Mazar Sharif, Kabul, Kandahar, and across Afghanistan. Now, uh, of course. Uh, tell yesterday there was somehow some hopes and heart of each girl and woman in Afghanistan. 
but unfortunately after the day i mean yesterday when they issued that you cannot go to courses universities madrasa so they feel like uh, it's end of the world for them because when you cannot go outside with you when you cannot go to educate yourself if you do not have any kind of freedom so obviously they have the worst ever feeling in their lives i mean we Ubaidullah, the the taliban since they took over 16, 16 months ago they've been saying that they will definitely look forward to guarantee certain rights for girls particularly when it comes to education now they're backtracking on every single commitment they made why do you think it happened I sometimes feel like they have this bucket list of all the promises they need to break and there's a high that they achieve every time they break a promise. Uh, I mean, people were desperately trying to believe that this wasn't the Taliban of the 90s. You have to understand some of the things that they're doing are worse than what they did in the 90s. Uh, and the fact that it's been a campaign of misleading the population they got girls to give their year 12 exams just two weeks ago, giving them the false hope that maybe universities were safe, maybe high schools were going to open soon. And then we have a directive about the universities. Today, we have a directive from the Ministry of Education stating that every province is to ensure that girls are not allowed in schools beyond grade six. This is for private institutes, for public institutes, for institutions that are even teaching languages or courses. Um, so it looks like the Taliban really want to implement this ban and they're leaving us no room to go with alternatives. There were alternatives of hidden schools, there were alternatives of online schooling, but with this crackdown, with how they've today actually raided mm -hmm. schools to make sure that no were there it just shows that it's it's getting worse about a few months ago sahara was in afghanistan and i've been to some of those schools particularly in mazar sharif and kabul i've met some of the female students absolutely smart passionate looking forward to continue their studies one of them still remember she told me she wants to become an astronaut and she wants to go to the united states of america for her postgraduate studies now with this decision is there any backup plan for them? Can NGOs step in to provide them with some sort of an alternative education? Otherwise, it's just going to be a massive disaster for them. As uh, Obedal also said, that uh, after this decision that they have made, they've closed all courses, all homeschools, all madrasas. So it's like that now we do not have any alternative at all, except the CBC um, classes that UNICEF uh, mm -hmm. is initiative for UNICEF, but I'm not sure that even uh, those will be able to be opened. Of course, uh, before that, we had option to teach girls at our homes or online or some other places. But at this moment, it's uh, almost 48 hours uh, that they have announced this decision. And in this 48 hours, I have received more than 50 calls from my students and they are repeatedly asking that what should we do? We are not allowed to do anything at all. So are we going to stay at home? Are we going to get married and just uh, raise a child? Is this our future? And obviously with this condition and if they are not going to change and if they are having the same issue, issues with girls' education. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that is going to be a very tough time, not just for women, but for all Afghans. And of, obviously, the consequences will not be the same that they think so. Okay. Ubaidullah, is it an indication that we have a divide within the Taliban leadership, some who are in favor, those who are not in favor, the so-called reformists and the old school? Or is it because we know that the Taliban come from the predominantly Pashtun areas, basically in the south, where people are reluctant to send their girls to school, where people are very conservative and they want to implement, implement that tradition across the country. You have to remember that Paktia, which is a Pashtun province, was the first province to stage demonstrations against a decision to close down schools. So I think that this is a misplaced generalization to think that Pashtuns in general are not in favor of education. The argument of the Taliban being two flanks or two sides on education, 
I mean, even if they are, what difference has that made? There were months before we reached this university ban, and the less conservative or pro-education Taliban had all the time in the world and all the political power to do something about it. Yet they were passive. Uh, they let it happen. Know that the decree for closing down universities isn't an individual department. It's not an individual ministry. It was signed and cleared by the cabinet, the cabinet that includes these moderates as well. So somehow uh, we've been failed by everyone, um, even the those who promised us education, even those whose daughters till date go to universities and schools around the world. Yet they sit in the cabinet and they sign on a document that says Afghan girls don't deserve to go to university. If it's not hypocrisy, I don't know what is. Saha, I mean, if you look at the past few months when the Taliban made those decisions about uh, female students' access to school, then in March 2022, they said that girls were bad from schools. And then in May, the Supreme Leader Haibatullah Akhun Zada said that it's about time for women to stay at home. That particular announcement by the Taliban, do you think it is just going to be the policy, the doctrine of the Taliban for as long as it takes in Afghanistan? Actually, on 23rd of March, when they stopped girls from going to school, they did not tell us, they did not give any issue that you, will, uh, you shouldn't be coming to school. But when girls went there, they were told to go back home. So simply it means they want to traumatize all female Afghans. Mm -hmm. This is their only, the only reason they are doing it. Else, why are they always giving us hope, but didn't they break it? They tell us that, okay, come to school, come to university. Then suddenly they say, no, it's closed. And of course, as you said that, Few months ago, when he said that women should be staying at home, of course, if women is not educated, if women are not allowed to be educated, we are gonna have a very dark Afghanistan. Maybe we will experience a day that there wouldn't be any educated woman. Mm. There will not be not be even one woman who is educated in Afghanistan. And most of my friends and my students since yesterday, they are planning how to leave Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So it's like that even if we had some women, some female who wanted to stay, now their decision has changed. Okay. They want to leave because they do not have any other option, any other alternative. I see your point. The Muslim world is expressing deep disappointment over the Taliban's order. Saudi Arabia, Turkey and Qatar, that played a major role in mediating between the Taliban and the US, are calling on Kabul to reverse the decision. Washington is threatening to take tougher action against the Taliban leaders. The Taliban uh, should expect that this decision, which is in contravention to the commitments they have made repeatedly and publicly uh, to their own people, uh, will carry costs, will carry concrete costs for them. And they have seriously, uh, possibly even fatally, uh, undermined one of their deepest ambitions uh, and other areas where uh, they seek progress. And that is an improvement, a betterment of relations with the United States and the rest of the world. Ubaidullah, this is what is baffling many people who are watching uh, events unfold in Afghanistan. On one hand, the Taliban made it clear that they're desperate for international recognition. Two, they're looking forward to see financial aid trickle in into the country and some of the assets which, were, which are frozen in the US Central Bank, Bank to be sent back to Afghanistan. But that will definitely depend on whether the, Afghan, the Taliban are willing to install some major reforms. They are giving the world indication today that they are not willing to make any reforms. What kind of impact do you think this will have on the Taliban and on the Afghan people? The Taliban, through their 20 years of insurgency, had become a fluid insurgency, which was a loosely affiliated subgroups that were working under one banner and, and for one goal. 
you would expect them to have transformed and gotten over that phase in the past one and a half years of governance. However, it appears that the hand is not talking to the mouth. No part of the system is talking to the other, and every system takes the decisions it needs to take with stamping from the emir himself, which is why those who are making the promises, A, aren't making the decisions, B, are passive, and don't take a stand on decisions that hurt Afghanistan know that we spent months arguing over the Federal Reserves, trying to find a mechanism for it to be released, and now that conversation is going to be paused. We spent months arguing with donors that we needed development aid, that emergency aid was not enough. That conversation is now going to be paused. We spent months asking the world to donate more and do more by Afghanistan. That conversation is going to stop. And, and then the engagement with the Taliban would stop. I mean, I do understand the argument where people are saying, OK, sanction them, hurt them. But how do you hurt the Taliban without hurting 35 million Afghans? Mm -hmm. Is there anything in the toolkit that specifically targets the Taliban? Because everything you do is going to have very large implications, very bad implications on the worst humanitarian crisis that is already existent in Afghanistan. Sahar, the brave woman who took to the streets in, in August, chanting bread, work and freedom. What, what's next for them? Do you think that they can still rely on the streets to be able to hope that one day they will be able to bring about some change? Uh, honestly speaking, today uh, when, I, when I saw a woman who is selling vegetables and if she is told that you have to stay home, her husband is dead, she doesn't have a son, and uh, what will be her future? who will bring bread for her. And of course, currently, uh, it is above 20 million Afghans who are having hunger crisis. So, pretend what will be the next year for us? It's like we are having more hunger issues. And plus, the girls who were coming to home schools, when we were having sessions with them, individual social sessions, most of them had suicidal thoughts. Even I have a student, she's only 13 years old. And once she wanted to commit suicide, along with her mother, and the reason was they did not have enough bread to eat. She said it's it was easier to die than to die from hunger. Mm -hmm. So pretend if it continues, then the situation is getting worse and worse. And finally, there will a day come that everyone will stand against. Because when you do not have anything to eat, when you do not have a future, when you cannot get education, everything is bad on you. So the basic human needs, freedom is one of them and survival is the another one. So if both is taken from you, what will you do? Abedullah, do, do, do the Afghans feel at this particular moment that they have been somehow betrayed by the world? I mean, uh, we need to give up this 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 thinking process of always expecting the international community to swoop in and save us. I mean, Afghanistan can only be fixed if the Afghans fix it. I mean, yes, the odds are against us, but we have to do what we can. You have to understand that the pro protests that have been going on since yesterday, the whole campaign of all or nothing, which means that either the girls are included or no one goes to school or university. That has potential. We are having conversations about how that translates into two months later when the winter break ends. Uh, what can we do in the form of national mobilization? Yes, the international community can complement such efforts, can connect with such thought within Afghanistan. But at the end of the day, Afghanistan solutions have to be organic, have to come from within the country, mm. um, and, and they have to be listened to. Saha, you know that the whole debate about the hijab, the male guardian for a girl, if she is planning to travel for long distance, the access to the public parks, in many, many parts of the Muslim world, people have moved beyond this debate. It's no longer something people are grappling with because of major, major reforms that were uh, into place for, for now for, for decades, except for, many, for some places, and Afghanistan is one of them. Uh, do you have hope that one day this is something that could convince the top leadership of the Afghanistan on the need to reform themselves or at least their own interpretation of Islam for women to thrive in Afghanistan? Actually, honestly speaking, 
as you said that Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and so many other Islamic countries, uh, they stood against this decision the Taliban took. And about the hijab, of course, what they define, what they have the definition of hijab is not the exact definition that Islam says. And uh, uh, the other reason that most of the times when it comes to education uh, of a school or universities, they say that uh, we want you to have hijab. But uh, I would want to say this to your program, to the world, that mm -hmm. Afghans do not have any issue with hijab. It's not only about hijab. If it was only about it, even before our girls, they, did, they were like always wearing the clothes that were so suitable according to the custom we have in Afghanistan. But of course, we are living in 21st century. And according to that, if we want to have a better future for Afghanistan, for our own people, we have to accept some changes. We have to adopt and we have to understand that in order to let girls grow, in order to have a better society for Afghanistan, we have to let girls educate. Do not put more pressure according to these things like hijab, all these, or you cannot travel alone. It's quite tough. For example, if girl's brother, he is always like going with her to work, mm -hmm. to school, to university, then when will he work? Or if your husband is always going here and there with, with you, then when will he work? How will they live? So it doesn't make exact sense that what Islam says. There are some rules, but of course, according to time, some rules are like changeable and you, ha you can adopt some changes according to situation that point. you live in. Ubaidullah, when you look at the situation in Afghanistan, the Taliban were asked to bring about an inclusive government. That didn't happen. There is a huge political divide between the Taliban and the society. There is also the issue of the treatment of the Hazara Shia community. There is an issue of reaching out to the opposition. And you add to the mix this problem with the uh, female uh, uh, education in Afghanistan. Could, they, could this be a sign by the Taliban or a message by the Taliban to the Afghan people, to the international community, that from now onwards they have to accept this reality, which is the Taliban will have the ultimate say over whatever they think is the best for the Afghan people? Yeah, uh, first off, um, huge respect to Sahar and, and her view on how, yeah, we, we did expect to have to make compromises. It's just that we didn't expect everything to be taken away. Um, there is this idea of how the Taliban right now are, are their politics seems to be addressed to their own constituencies. And you would expect them to have changed that mindset and realize that now they are responsible for a whole country. So the social contract seems to not have been established or extended. There is also this idea that the constant attempts to coercively implement their vision on a large population has historically proven to fail in Afghanistan, in this region as a whole. So if they truly want their regime to stay and they truly do not want the Afghan population's grievances to reach a level where they stand up to them, they will have to listen to the educated youth of Afghanistan. They will have to create a synthesis of these two visions into something more sustainable, something that we aren't seeing. It seems that they're indifferent towards the population and they're indifferent towards the world and all that it matters to them is appeasing their own hardline ranks. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there, but I promise you, Sahar, that we'll continue to talk about this particular issue, hoping that tomorrow is going to be a better day for the Afghan uh, woman. Sahar Abedullah Bahir, I really appreciate your insight. Looking forward to talking to you in the future. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashem Arbala, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.